Welcome to Q&A Selling Online with answers to questions about creating an online empire, promoting products, or building a brand. Your host, private label and e-commerce entrepreneur, Quinn Amorm. Welcome to the show, my friends. Today's guest, an online coach who's helped people get to 20K of business within a week or two just by tweaking their social media. Over the last 15 years, he's sold a vast number of products online from physical products, info products, high ticket coaching pro uh, programs, and he was even a dating coach for men. It took him nearly a decade from when he started his first website to creating something that actually made money. This is something that I, I know exactly that feeling. And now after 15 years of learning how to market effectively online, he started offering his services as a business coach. Welcome, Richard Fletcher. Richard, how's hey, it going? Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here, Quinn. Uh, I'm really good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, man, it's a pleasure having you, Richard. So uh, th there's many things that I want to ask you. And uh, let's start, I guess we'll start from the beginning. What was one of your first businesses or side hustle, uh, not necessarily online, just any kind well, of Well, the first thing I did, actually, like uh, I went after university, I went traveling for a year, like all around the world. When I was like 22. Then I came back. I was like, I don't want to work for someone else. I'll start a business. And I ended up signing up, you know, Herbalife, the MLM yes. company, like huge, yeah. everyone's heard of them. Um, yeah, I signed up with them and I was like, I just, you know, I lapped it all up. My upline distributor's like, if you're, if you're a serious business person and you want to, you know, you want to make the proper money, you're going to need to sign on at the super duper diamond level mega distributor plan or whatever, which ended up with like $3,000 worth of stock mm -hmm. uh, that I had to buy. Uh, and then he just like sat in my parents' garage for months, which they weren't happy with. I uh, didn't sell any of it. And then six months later, I had to like take it all down the tip because it was out of, because <laughs> it was out of date. That was my first, um, my first foray into business. And, you know, since, since we were on the, since we we're, uh, your podcast is all about failing and failing fast. Well, I've, I've failed a lot of times in that 10 years. I mean, I know you, before I actually started making any money, I know you said you identify that as well. But yeah, that was the first yeah. one and it wasn't great. But hey, you've got to start somewhere, right? Oh, yes. I hear you, man. Uh, I started websites. I, I've, I've been selling online. Uh, I mean, I started part time, but, uh, it was in 1997 that I started and things were very different. And of course, like, you know, there was no YouTube or n nobody out there to teach us anything. And, uh, it was kind of, let's try it. Did it work? No. Okay. Try again. <laughs> like 95% email open rate. <laughs> yes. Did you, um, did you have any of those experiences where you, you would try something just because you thought about it by yourself and then it would work or not? Well, most of the things I did in the early days was stuff I, I tried myself because mm -hmm. I didn't really have anyone to, you know, there wasn't like everywhere you look, there's a business coach these days, including yeah. me. So it's, it's not hard to find someone who's telling you, but by then it was not, people were just kind of getting on with it behind the scenes. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really a thing, was it? Like the idea of online marketing, like everyone knows the idea that some people make money online nowadays, even though where I come from, it's still kind of weird and unusual. Everyone, everyone's heard of it, but mm -hmm. back then, no one was really doing this stuff. Um, like 2005, I started a website called The Travel Monkey, which was aimed at, because like I said, I went on a world trip. It was aimed at backpackers who wanted to do their first world trip, like how to get around the world, how to get cheap sort of around the world tickets and uh, how to avoid being scammed in various places. And you know, all these kind of like articles on my website and stuff. And I got some good feedback from it. I, I just built it up. I got like, you know, a couple of months, I had like 1,500 unique businesses a month, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and I had people downloading a guide, which I had for free. And they were like, oh, this is really helpful. Thanks. But I couldn't figure out a way to monetize it. I just had um, an affiliate link to like some backpacks on Amazon and like mm -hmm. a couple of other things. And I think I sold one backpack for like $80, which gave me the commission of like $3. Because <laughs> it's a physical product. You know, you, it's not like an ebook where you get 75%. Um, and that was it. I was like, after six months of that, I was like, I can't figure out how to make any money out of this. So I closed it down. And now I look back at that, Quinn, and I'm like, damn, that could have been like TripAdvisor or something. Man, that would have been something probably right that by now. You know, around the same time, I don't know if it was oh, maybe, oh, maybe 2007, I had a, a video website that... You probably, most people in North America never heard about it, but in the UK, I was getting 90,000 unique visitors per month. Wow. Because I ranked number one for the keyword Rude Tube. And Rude Tube was a TV show in the UK. Mm. I remember that. Yeah. And um, in North America, nobody, nobody ever heard about that. So nobody would search it, but I would get 90,000 searches or unique visitors for that keyword. So I started 
uh, getting videos from the show and I was actually putting them on my, my site <laughs> on purpose. So, uh, wow. Yeah. I ended up, uh, Google removed the, um, the AdSense from it. I couldn't, I couldn't get money from Google. So it had to be affiliates. But anyway, that was, uh, uh another, another waste. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, we talk about failure. You look at, I look at the number of things I've done that have been a failure. It's probably like 90%. It might be higher, you know. So I think anyone, anyway, I don't know what, I don't know what, like, oh, what, what stage are most of your listeners at? Are they like beginners or are they like across the whole spectrum? Or, you know, what's, is there like a typical listener you've got on your show, Quinn? Yeah. On the, uh, I, I host two podcasts and they're actually pretty different audiences in, in the, the, the fail fast podcast are as a more mature audience. Uh, and, of course, just like uh, on most of the, most of the podcasts, it's a 60% male audience. Uh, and the majority of those are, um, uh, already in business. Right. So, okay. Yeah. My, my other podcast is the Q and A selling online is uh, about, you know, uh, selling on Amazon and e-commerce. It's more e-commerce and uh, focus with Amazon and the higher percentage of people are trying to get into business. Mm. Mm. I think. Yeah. You know, if most of your listeners have already got some business of some description, even if it's not mega money, I think you c- I don't think you can overestimate the amount of personal growth required and how difficult it is just to get to that point where you're making even like one dollar on your own. It's really, really quite difficult. Um, there's so many people posting about it, especially on Facebook and that, but I think still even these days, hardly anybody's making any money. There's very few people who are actually making money out there. Everyone's trying their best, but you look in these Facebook groups and no, I've got a Facebook group um, called the Magic Source for Online Marketing, and there's like four thousand people in there. But you know, most of the people in there are trying to make it; they're not there already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, I don't know if you uh, if you noticed that, but there's so many people that are, are sharing their successes, mm. and, and they're not sharing the failures. And unfortunately, the successes that we see as a gross sales does not mean anything right gross sales like you know doesn't mean that the people yeah, people like, are making any money uh it's so that'd be, a, that'd be a click funnels click funnels two comma club award it's like you made a million dollars through click funnels but it doesn't say how much you spent in advertising to get there it's like spent two million in ads and made a million back you've got this big plaque on your wall it's like well okay yeah absolutely and i i know that for selling online i know that for example doing a launch we can we can generate a lot of money very quickly. Let's say first month, month one. Mm-hmm. But uh, just um, a few weeks ago, I was doing uh, I was invited to do a, a talk here at uh, for Amazon Sellers Group, and I was uh, people were asking me about volume, and of course I don't want to tell everybody my numbers, but I showed them that the launch, and we were doing thirty five grand on a month a month one of launching a product. And some people thought it was amazing, but I told them, just so you know, we have spent 45 so far <laughs> doing this launch, mm. right? So it's, it looks beautiful, but the reality is we spent 45 to generate 35. Of course, mm. we're planning on going to get it back in the future. But I, if I share a screenshot of that, people are going to think it's easy and it's not. Yeah, of course. I, th- I think it's great you were honest about it though because most people would just be like, hey, look, 35 grand in the first month, sign up to my course, you know, nine nine seven dollars you'll <laughs> learn all the secrets. You know, like, the secret is you need to spend 45K. It doesn't sound so good then. <laughs> yeah, that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here, here's one thing I don't know. Uh, it's a, you used to be at one point a dating coach. Mm. And what exactly is a dating coach? Uh, well, there's, ver- there's various types of dating coaches, but what I did was specifically, uh, my market was like intelligent guys who had some sort of career. And I, we're not talking like, you know, losers who, with no job, who, no prospects, who just like sponge off their parents. I'm actually, I'm the kind of guys who like have got something to offer, uh, the kind of people I want to help, who are like as people who just aren't putting themselves across in the right way. And they come across, you know, they're typically come across as like geeks or shy or awkward. And they would be, they're typically the guy who gets stuck in the friend zone. So mm-hmm. I would help those guys kind of present themselves in the right way uh, uh, so they can meet the kind of woman they want to be with. And then, well, well I'll see you. Let nature take care of the rest. And that's, that's literally it. And, you know, there's, you know, there's some guys who have some good success stories with, like, within a couple of weeks, like, one guy is great, you know, and obviously, you know, he's loving life now, you know, meeting that kind of women, he's dating someone, whatever. He's, he's having a great time with it. And beforehand, he was really struggling. Um, so, yeah, I, I had quite a few people like that. And I basically taught them. I think a lot of coaching is about, certainly for me, is like, coaching former versions of yourself like whatever problem you've had to figure out in your own life 
you then kind of go, okay, all right, I've had to learn all this stuff and go through all these hurdles, and now I'll teach other people how to get over those hurdles quicker than I did. I mean, that's why I got into business coaching. It was like, it's taken me over a decade to get to the point where I make any money. Um, maybe I can show other people how they can get there and not spend a decade. You know, mm-hmm. if they can forget, if they, there are a lot of people think that you'd spend six months to get there. It's like, oh no, six months. Six months is nothing. If you got, if you got there where you're making money from now, from nothing in six months time, that would be amazing. Yes. Yes. I, I really like that approach. And it's so true that. Today's date is different than when we started. Things are more available, so there's a lot of more mm. resources. People can learn faster, and of course, they can probably, or, or more than likely, don't need 10 years to to get to something that uh, mm. is going to be successful. But uh, the fact that... Yeah. Well, you're right in that sense. Sorry to interrupt. You're, you're right in that sense, but it's also, there's a lot more rubbish information. So it's, it's, hard oh, yeah. to, it's harder to find the good stuff. So it's like uh, you know, like needle and haystack kind of scenario, isn't it? It's sort of back in the olden days, there was less information. But nowadays, you get someone who does like a digital marketing course that takes like two hours, or they buy like you know one forty-seven dollar ebook about digital marketing, and then they've turned up and they said, then they call themselves a business coach after that. And it's sort of if you're if you're brand new to business and you don't know the difference between that and someone who's actually talking sense, and you sign up with that, well, you're going to waste a lot of time and money. So it's I kind of feel for the people who are like absolute beginners who are like, who do I trust here? It's really difficult these days. I'm not even sure I've got an answer for them. No, no, I absolutely agree with that because I feel like like what you said that because you lived it. Now you have the the experience, and there's so so many coaches or what would you call them? The, the guy that launches a course with mm. limited knowledge, but now they start making a lot of money from the course itself because the content is out there, and all you have to do is get somebody else's content and launch a course. And mm. right. you hear every day now the stories are. Just yesterday, I was homeless, and and now <laughs> I'm I'm making millions and. I hear them, and of course, there's there's a lot of those stories that are true. But I mean, if you were homeless yesterday and you were negative 150 grand today, I doubt that you have a million in the bank. There, there's no such thing. Right? Yeah, it's a standard f- copywriting Facebook formulaic ad of like, I used to be a pathetic, worthless loser who slept in a sewer and ate rats for breakfast until one day, one day I discovered, you know, the one secret to online marketing. And now I make, you know, last month I made $123,976 and 76 cents. Cause I, someone's told me I have to put an exact number or it's not believable. You know? And yes. I'm just like, Oh God, not another one of these ads. Um, yeah. I mean, I see stuff like this all the time I, and everyone's copying each other. Uh, one of, one of the things that I think is really important is like I teach principles as in the principles of marketing, like what it is that, um, for example, Facebook, you scroll on your Facebook feed. There's a billion people. It doesn't matter what you do. You're a fitness coach, you're a business coach, you're a spiritual coach. You've got competition and you've got a bunch of other people who are also saying, Hey, if you want to learn how to achieve enlightenment, like the Buddhist monks or whatever, um, you know, join my system. Well, if there's like another 10 people on your feed saying the same thing today, it all blurs into one. Like five years ago, that might have been a great post, but today, because everyone's copying those posts, what was a good post even last year ceases to be a good post today. Um, so you've got to understand the principles of what is what today is going to make people stop in their tracks and go, oh, what was he saying there? I'm going to carry on reading. And then reels them in kind of slowly and makes them kind of read every word and makes them want to um, take action and makes them go, do you know what? Even though I've read like 50 posts today that have been absolute nonsense and I don't believe a word of it, for some reason, I trust this guy. And there's a lot of psychological principles that go into that, even a simple like 200 word post that seems really basic. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, but unfortunately, because most people, well, people are lazy and frankly, so am I, you know, we all have that kind of like laziness gene where if there's a shortcut, we'll take it. But they, they want, everyone wants that kind of that cut and paste magic post that is going to sell a hundred percent of, you know, the people who read it or whatever. And it's just, unfortunately, even if you could get your hands on that, it's not going to work in six months time because everyone's going to find it and start using it. Good example, uh, on Facebook, uh, engagement wise maybe six to nine months ago a post i was seeing all the time was what's the most challenging thing in your business Mm -hmm. uh in groups that was getting loads of engagement but now that gets hardly any responses because everybody's done it and now you see that and instead of going oh i'm going to respond to this you kind of roll your eyes you're like oh 
it's another business coach doing that thing where they're trying to get engagement and they're trying to get their audience to tell them what the problem is because they can't be bothered figuring it out themselves. They can't be bothered doing the research themselves. And they're trying, what they're really trying to do is get some leads in so they can then private message those people and be like, oh, you don't get any leads? Well, let me talk to you about my system. It's like, I know what's going to happen here, so I'm not going to fall for it. Um, but people don't realize that. So if they, if they take a course that was made even six months ago that says this is a good kind of post, they'll copy and paste it and it won't work and they won't know why. Oh, man, I... I really love what you said. You know, one of the posts that uh, used to infuriate me was when somebody would put, and, and then the same day somebody would post something, a ton of my of people on my list would post exactly the same one. And it would be, uh, pineapple belongs on pizza. Prove me wrong. <laughs> I've seen lots of those. <laughs> so I, you, know, you know what I do? Uh, I either unfriend that person or if it is something that I actually, somebody that I actually don't want to unfriend, I would unfollow. So I will never see a notification from them again because <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, it's ridiculous to the mm. point some it's of like, those questions. So, but that just, that proves the point, doesn't it? That, you know, six months ago, you'll be, you, you're, you're going to be, you're probably going to reel into that. Like, cause it's, it's easy to answer. You scroll on your phone quickly. Yeah. You can either be like, oh my God, that's the most disgusting thing ever. Or you'd be like, oh my God, I love it. It kind of just riles you up a bit. So the characteristics of the post, and I'm happy to talk about the, there's three things that basically make a good engagement, like the almost guarantee engagement, which I can come to if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, those, those things are true. That's what I was talking about principles. Those things are true and they will always be true. Like, you know, if we had this conversation, if somehow we got cryogenically frozen and came back in a million years' time, those things would still be true about humans. But the thing that would be exact posts would not be different. Not, would, not, would not be the same, sorry. You know, it'd, be, it'd be a different thing. We would have moved on. The words would be different, but the principles would be the same. Um, because obviously you, you saw that post about pineapple first. And it was like, oh, this is interesting. This is fun. But then yeah. the 10th person that's done it is not as fun anymore. Um, but yeah, but do, do you want to do you want to say three principles of what makes a good engagement post? Um, you can, people can go away and do this now if they want to try it. Okay. And uh, do you want to mention those? What are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you right now. So three things. Number, so if you ask, generally it's a question that you ask of your audience. So let's say you're on Facebook and you ask them a question, uh, that then invites your audience to answer. Simple. But the, the three characteristics of the question are, number one, it has to be easy to answer. So if I'm scrolling on my phone, uh, if you ask me like, what are the seven most difficult things about achieving enlightenment? I'm going to be like, oh, hey, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, let me come back to that and I won't come back to it. Uh, but if you ask a simple question like ketchup, does it belong in or out of the fridge? Well, I can just type in the fridge or out the fridge on my phone and carry on scrolling. But I can leave a longer answer if I want to, if I've got more to say on it. So what you're going to get is most of the answers are just going to be like in the fridge, out the fridge, especially if you've got one in the fridge, two out the fridge. You'll get people literally just typing one or two. Um, secondly, uh, it's got to be universal or as close to universal across your audience as possible. So again, if you're like, you know, what's the most annoying thing about traveling to the moon well not there's not very many people in your audience who's like been up in a space rocket so you're not going to get much engagement you know silly example but a lot of people are doing this they're going really specific like really specific questions that very few people in their audience are going to be able to answer so if you make it something that's um universal like universal experiences that we all have as human beings you're going to get more people responding and the third one which is more subtle is to appeal to ego so if you ask a question the makes me feel like I'm better or smarter or more attractive or any kind of positive trait where I can see myself as being better than another person, then I'm more likely to answer. Because as humans, although we although we like to pretend we're all enlightened and you know we we don't wear I'm not like that, you know, I don't care about that. Mm. As human beings, we're all animals and we're all striving for status all the time. So that's why. So I gave an example. I did a, a live video on my I think it was on my Facebook personal feed a couple weeks ago where I said I said these three things. And I gave an example of a post that fits all of these, which is what's the most annoying, what's the most annoying thing you see at the gym? So, you know, most people go to the gym or have been to the gym or have some experience of a gym. Um, it's easy to answer because, you know, I think right, right now, oh, you know, people doing curls in a squat rack or, uh, you know, when there's like four 17 year olds who are taking up the one bench I want and they're all sat there texting each other for half an hour instead of doing any exercises. Well, that's annoying. Or, there are these sweaty bastards that leave like a pool of sweat dripping down the bench. You, know? you can think of loads of these. Dead easy to answer. Um, but the appeal to ego thing is what's the most annoying thing is, well, when I answer it, I'm automatically implying that these idiots are doing this and I'm not because I'm better than they are. So I get to feel like I'm smarter and wiser and better than these people in the process. Whereas what a lot of people do is they ask that question, 
what's the thing you're struggling most with in this area? Well, in order to answer the what's I'm struggling with question, I've now got to take a hit to my ego. I've got to admit on a public forum that I'm doing something wrong, that, you know, that um, I failed in some way, that I'm stupid, that, uh, that I'm probably more stupid than the person asking the question because they're like obviously a coach in that area. I don't want to do all that stuff. So you see, if you see any of those crop, crop questions, generally they will have fewer comments than the ones that are like, you know, tell me a way in which you're very smart, basically. Um, so no, it, it doesn't have to be like, what's the most annoying thing about that? Or why is this so stupid? It doesn't have to be negative. Even something like anytime I post, uh, my audible queue is getting, you know, I'm nearly at the end of my audible queue. Can you recommend some good business audio books for me to you know, stock up on? Uh, routinely, I get 60, 70, 80 comments on that without even bothering because everyone wants to feel like they've got the answer. Like, oh, I've yeah. got a good one here. I've got a good one you won't have heard of. Think and grow rich. I'm like, yeah, thanks for <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of that one before. Wow, amazing. Seven habits of highly effective people. Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> Four hour work week. <laughs> yeah. It's like, where do you get these obscure books from? Wow. You must be. <laughs> Ty Lopez here reads 50 books a week. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. But, but you get that. Everyone wants to feel, everyone wants to feel it's like, it's the same reason people like quiz shows. They want to feel like they're smart. They want to feel like they've got the answer. So if you appeal to that, you're going to get the engagement. Obviously, engagement doesn't sell anything, but it's a starting point if you want to start, start to market yourself online organically, which is obviously what I teach. Yeah, and I guess there's so much competition. Now, when it comes to coaching, uh, there, are, like you said, on Facebook, you can see coaches everywhere and everybody's trying to get some engagement so they can get build a following, right? You need to build a right. following so you're known because people buy from the ones they know, love, and trust. So you are a successful coach now, but you started with, you were doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, was it, for 500 bucks? And now- Yeah, you, that's right. And now you are at a different level where you have, you actually have your, is it an eight-week course? Is that right? It's six-week course. Six week. Um, yeah, six-week six week course is uh, six and a half K in US dollars. So uh, yeah, a big transition for me. It was, God, it was probably only about four or five years ago, I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching in the dating stuff for $500 a month, which you know, I thought was quite good at the time. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was talking to her for an hour and a week and a bit of support on Messenger. It's like, oh, this is great. But then um, I discovered about high-ticket coaching, which was still a relatively new thing back then. Uh, and instead, I charged, uh, I created an eight-week course for 5000 which is you know, instant pay rise there. Um, but what was really interesting was uh, um, within, I think, five days of creating that course, I got my first sale, which was like, Oh my God, you know, that blew my mind that someone would pay that, which was, was great for confidence. I think if I've had like the first 50 conversations go south, I might be like, you know, I'm, we might not be having this conversation now, Corinne. Um, but yeah, so, so I looked at that and I was just like, wow, oh, this is amazing. But what was even more amazing to me is that I became a much better coach overnight. Not because I learned any more, it was just because uh, the, per the people took me so much more seriously. Like, I'm paying this guy five grand, he must be really good. Uh, so I'm going to do what he says. Plus, I've paid this guy five grand. I better bloody well get a result. So they, they just take it more seriously. When I say go out and do this or say this or do whatever, they would go and do it. Whereas the guys beforehand were a bit like, a bit like dipping their little toesies in the, in the cold pool. It's like, oh, it's a little bit cold. I'm not going to jump in. You know, I'm not quite invested enough. But if they had, if they had like, you know, if someone had taken, say, five grand off them and said, you don't get this back until you jump in, well, they're going to jump straight in. And that's kind of what it was like for my guys. So uh, this is an online course. What, what kind of right, platform? Yeah. What kind of platform is it on? Um, I did have it on ClickFunnels. I've now got it. I've moved, I've moved all that to my WordPress site. So I've got a, a members area on my WordPress site. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they get obviously weekly. There's weekly videos with exercises for them to complete. Uh, but the main point about it is they get one-on-one -on -one support from me uh, because I think a big. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe you, you can tell me your experience with online courses because I'm sure you've done them all as well, just like I have over the years. But yeah. one of the things that always annoyed me about courses is you get the information, but no one ever seems to be able to make it relevant to you. I'm like, I would take the information, like when I was doing my dating stuff, and be like, okay, that makes sense how to do that. So they'd go and create a landing page, and I'd be like, I feel like I've taken what they said, but it looks crap. Like I just thought, well, there's something not quite right about it, or people aren't signing up, and I don't know why, but there's no one there to give support. So I kind of take what they need to know and make it relevant. Okay, for your business, this is what you need to go and do right now, um, which is when we talk about standing out from a crowd, that's one of the main selling points in our program because you can take the other programs that are like, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10K, but all you're getting is limited support in someone's Facebook group where you ask a question and four days later you get like a one-word response or a one-sentence response. It's just not, it's not enough, is it, when you're trying to learn? 
Yeah, and it's not the response doesn't come from the person that, that you were hoping mm. it would come from. It can come That's from right, another yeah. student that is giving you his guess, their best guess. Exactly, yeah. It's a blind help in the blind. It's like a load of people who don't know what they're doing, who've all yeah. signed up for the same course, who were like, oh, what I would do is this. It's like, well, I didn't pay to get someone else's help. I paid to get you know, the main person's help who was nowhere to be seen. Um, a lot of courses are doing that right now, which is, um, I can see why they do it because a lot of people go one on one and then they go, okay, I can only scale so far with one on one. Then they go, well, I'll do a group program instead. So then they can only, then they scale with a group program and then they get to a point where they go, well, I've got so many people in that I can't support them all myself. I'll get some hired guns in to help me out. And then they separate themselves from a the process, which is fine from a business point of view in terms of scaling, but I have not seen a program yet where the level of quality of the program itself has not gone down as a result of that happening, in my opinion, at least. And I'm sure some people would disagree with that. Uh, that's why I'm not, a lot of people have said that to me, like you could be making a hell of a lot more money. Um, you know, one, you could be making like, you know, 500 grand a month or something. If you, you know, scaled up and you got these coaches in, you did a lot. I'm like, I know this, I know the theory behind it, but I haven't figured out a way to keep the quality of the program. So you know, I'm quite happy to say where I am. Yeah. So when you offer the, this, this one to one, uh, of course, you're doing it remotely. <clears throat> Is it something like Skype, Zoom, or in, in what, what kind of time do they have to be with you? Uh, because I know there could be people that abuse your time while others don't have so much uh, one-on-one. Um, generally, I mean, I always have a call with people before I sign them up. And the main reason for that is, from my point of view, is to first of all figure out, well, can I help this person? But secondly, like, do I like him? Right? Like, you know, you kind of, I don't know, I suppose, sometimes I get it, now and again I get it wrong, but I'd say, you know, maybe probably more than nine times out of ten, uh, like maybe like 95 times out of 100, I'd say that from a 40 minute or so chat with someone, I can figure out whether I'm going to like him or not. And the answer says, is, the answer test for me is, would I be willing to sit and have a beer in a pub with this guy one on one or this, or this lady one on one for like a couple of hours and have a chat? Not about business, just about, you know, as I like, you know, in a, in a friendly capacity. And if the answer is no, generally I don't invite him to come in my program because I'm going to be spending a lot of time with him. But that also means that, uh, these people aren't, these people tend to be like, they're not that kind of person where generally the kind of people I sign up are like, Oh, I'm sorry. I've sent you too many questions. You know, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be bothering you. And I'm like, no, no, it's fine. You can bother me. That's what you pay me for. The kind of person who is naturally respectful in that kind of way is the kind of person I want to be signing up. I don't want to be signing up these people like, <laughs> let's see how much I can get out of him. That's not who I want to be working with. So it's not, it's not generally a problem. What I tend to find is the support seems to be front loaded. So I don't say, Oh, we get one call a week. Generally in the first couple of weeks, people have got a lot to learn. Um, uh, they know they need to speak to me more often. They're speaking, sending me messages on messenger all day long and I'm responding. But after a couple of weeks, They've kind of got it, and then they just, you know, it's just now and again, message here and there. So rather than say, oh, you get one call a week, you kind of get the support you need up front, uh, and then we can tail off. Uh, it also means that if people want to go faster and do the program in less time, they can do that as well. And is that what you call the magic sauce? Uh, no, I mean, the magic sauce is a name that I came up with uh, when I was inventing my Facebook group. and uh, That's what, what I call... Um, like, what do you do? How do you stand out from the crowd? So we talked about, you know, even if you're like an enlightenment coach or whatever, there's still like a bunch of other ones of those. If you're a fitness coach or a business coach, well, forget it. There's a billion other fitness coaches out there. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to get you in shape. You have to have something that goes, okay, how is this person different to the other billion people offering that? And if you can demonstrate how you're different in a believable way where people go, do you know what? Even though even though I've done like 45 diets over the last 10 years and uh, the best that's happened is I lose the weight and I put it back on again. This time I believe it's different. That's the magic source. What goes into that to make a person believe who, despite the fact that they failed so many times before, they believe this time it's going to work. Okay. Gotcha. <clears throat> so you've had, uh, from the people that you trained or coached there, there's been some success stories, right? There's uh, uh can you tell me the story about the 10 K a week guy? Uh, 10k a week. Yeah, it was, it's been a few. There was the, uh, there was a photographer who, uh, I mean, generally, I mostly work with like other coaches these days, but yeah, the, there was a photographer who came to me. Uh, it was like, I'm not signed up that many people and like, I'd like to make more money. So we went into his offer and he's a, he's a wedding photographer who specializes in pre wedding shoots. Have you heard of pre wedding shoots? Are they a thing in Canada? Pre wedding? Uh, actually, yeah, yes, yes, I know, I know now. Uh, I, I um I haven't been in one, but I know I know what they are. Yeah, well, well, I'm not. Yeah, it's not really a thing in the UK either, particularly as far as I'm aware. Um, but yeah, where where he's from, he's like um, 
I think he's like I think he's like half Japanese, half New Zealand, um, or certain Asian, some kinds of Korean or Japanese. Um, uh, he specialises in these pre wedding shoots, so he's finding like fairly rich couples six months out from a wedding would fly in from Japan or Korea or whatever. They'd fly into Queenstown, New Zealand, which is like you know a well known holiday destination, lots of like mountains, mountains and scenery, or whatever. They'd come, they'd hire a wedding dress and a wedding suit when they're there. Uh, and then they'd get dressed up. He'd fly them up a mountain in a helicopter with champagne and stuff and take them out to remote locations and like the really scenic stuff and take lots of really kind of fancy arty pictures of them. Uh, then they'd return their dress and stuff and back to whatever shop they got it from. Then they'd fly home again and they'd have all these really fancy shots six months out from the wedding. Then they'd go and get married in Tokyo or whatever. And, you know, but now they've got all these shots of a mountain and stuff like that, like really cool stuff. So this pre-wedding thing is like quite a thing. But I said to him, like, these people flying in, I said, like, how much do you charge now? He's like $1,500 a day, which sounds good, doesn't it? But then he's like, well, yeah, but then I've got like a helicopter ride in that and, you know, suddenly all these other expenses and stuff, it quickly adds up. I was like, well, what's the most expensive pre-wedding uh, person in your area charge? He says 10 grand a day. I go, well, what are they doing different? He goes, well, not a lot really. They've got these slightly bigger drones of my, of than I have that they send up and they can take some other fancy pictures, but I could easily buy one of those. I was like, okay, so it's not, in terms of picture quality or end result, it's not a lot different. No, not really. Okay. So I said, I've got something you can do, but it's going to require big brass balls. And you're going to need, you know, you're going to need to be a bit brave about this. And it might not be, you know, it might not be for everybody. Do you want to hear it? And he goes, okay, go on. Then what is it? I said, we, sir, we changed the main page on your site, but we set up a separate page if you want to test it, which is what we did at first. We set up a page that says, I am the most expensive wedding photographer in Queenstown, New Zealand. And there's a good reason for that. Dot, dot, dot. And then we spend the rest of the page showing some of his awesome shots. Now, this works because he's a brilliant photographer. Like, his, his photos are amazing, like unbelievable. But so, you know, when you see the photos, it's not like, you know, I just took like a crappy night shot with my iPhone. You're like, what the hell's that? <laughs> it actually looks good. But you know, he's, uh, uh, then I wrote some copy for him that basically took through the idea of why he's the most expensive, uh, why anyone who's anyone who is interested in getting the very best, the premium option, would be mad to choose anyone but him. Um, what he did is that uh, that means that uh, probably 90% of the market are not interested in him because they want the cheaper option. But the ones who want, I call them the Valentino shoppers, the ones like the Gucci, the ones who want like the really fancy products, it's like, I want, I, not only do I want the fancy products, I want to be able to tell all my friends that I got the fancy products. I want to be able to, I want to be able to say to them, I spent 15K on my wedding day because, you know, on, not even on the wedding day, on the pre wedding shoot, for God's sake, for one day, I spent 15K on the pre wedding shoot. Do you know why? Because we don't mess around when it comes to this stuff. It's our wedding and it's too important. And, you know, other people want to scrimp and save. Other people want to mess around and you know, take the cheap option. That's up to them. Uh, but, you know, we do things properly around here. And they can kind of tell that story to their friends and feel like, they're, again, again, appealing to ego, like I said before, Queen, you know, like with the engagement post, they get to feel like they're better than all the people who can't afford it. Um, so yeah. you feel, you're appealing to a market. And what's great is that, well, he's now booked out. That was a year ago. He's now booked out and he's raising prices again. I think he's charging 20K now. He's probably going to go up again because he's like, I've got too much work. I can't do it all. He's now hiring staff to help him out. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and he's just like, how are people paying this for the same service? But it's perception. And you now everyone in the every, every market, I believe, has these Valentino shoppers and the opportunity to reach them. But the problem is because people are like, oh, no, no, no one's going to pay for that. No, no, no one's going to pay me 3K to do a fitness coaching thing when a normal gym uh, you know, a normal personal trainer charges like you know twenty five dollars an hour. Well, there's celebrities there. How much is a celebrity paying for their trainer? If they're not paying them twenty five dollars an hour. Um, yeah. You know, rich CEOs are they going for some like cheap twenty five dollars an hour personal trainer in a local gym? Or are they find oh, or do they come at a different angle and go, okay, what is the best personal trainer around? I'm not interested in the price. Who's the best one? Okay, uh, what hundred dollars an hour? Right, off we go. You know, and it's a different kind of conversation. That's what he finds with the people who contact him now. They hardly ever talk about price. It's literally okay. So um, I saw that other couple on your on your blog with the uh, the champagne going up the mountain. Um, how do we get that? You know, um, can we get a Bentley to come pick us up from the airport? You know, these are the kind of questions that they're asking. It's not like, oh, if you would you be able to knock a hundred dollars off, please? <laughs> we don't. We could really use that money. It's like. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can you can have the Bentley, but it's going to knock the price up to 20K. Okay, no problem. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. You know, that that's so incredible because the the bigger the the bigger the customer or the bigger the budget, the more appealing those pictures are going to be to other people's mm. ego. So mm. so by doing now that, 
he is automatically making more money, but also growing his exposure because those pictures become more shareable, right? Right. right. When you, the pictures are, you're in a Rolls Royce on top of a mountain being dropped by an helicopter or something. Uh, I mean, those are shareable <laughs> pictures. <laughs> and, and a Rolls Royce inside a helicopter up a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't want to see that? <laughs> So that's kind of like James Bond kind of stuff. And it is, it isn't, yeah. <laughs> people would want to see that. And then they're going to see who the photographer that was that did those special shots. And uh, I mean, it's ego is here is what's at play here. Right. Because uh, people want to feed it and they want to, I mean, it's the appearances. They want others to know that they spent it. So, I mean, what a great technique that is. Mm. It's, it's that simple as well. It's one of those things where you just go, You've got to change this. You could change this overnight and make a lot of money. It's like, do you know what? I'll set up a separate page and we'll see if it works. And I can always go back to the old page if it doesn't. And suddenly, you know, when he gets his first inquiry and he's like, he messaged me, go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, someone's messaged me. I'm like, okay, well, go and talk to him then. And then he's like, they signed up. I'm like, it's, it's, I think he, then he got to the point where he felt nervous because he's like, they've just paid me 15K. Like, what well, they're going to expect all this extra, oh my God, it's going to be, and they're like, it's not, it's just like normal. If anything, they treat him better because he's the kind of photographer who, who can command 15K. So you don't mess that guy around. Because if you mess that guy around, he tells you to get lost and now you've got to go for the cheap one. Yeah, absolutely. So they have to be extra nice to him. He's like, listen, I'm the, I'm the celebrity photographer. So, you know, if you mess me around. If it's not, if there's not a hundred other ones of these of me around. It's a lot of cheap guys, but you don't want to go with them, do you? It's a, he get, he gets a kind of walker. It kind of sort of feeds his ego as well in a way. Yeah, you know, we did a test with that with uh, one of the business that I have, which is a physical business. And it was, um, sorry, it's got a kitchen cabinet business. And we did, made the, we had this discussion once of who do we want to be? Do we want to be the IKEA of kitchen cabinets or which is, uh, sorry, um, the IKEA is one that already exists. So we, we mentioned it in terms of cars. Do we want to be the Ferrari of kitchen cabinets? or the Hyundai of kitchen cabinets. Mm. And we decided with, after doing the, the, the um, uh, we measured analytics and all that, and we figured that it would be uh, almost four times less uh, the number of customers that we would get. But at uh, four times less customers, we would make exactly the same amount of money. Hmm. Yeah. So you can, in, instead of four customers, you can get one, make that one customer super happy. They're going to tell all their friends. And again, it would be like my kitchen is, you know, we have a forest city kitchen and everybody would be mm. happy with that. So, uh, mm. that, that, no, that that's, was, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, you can, I, th it's possible to go down the Ikea route, you know, and model yourself on Ikea or, Walmart is probably a good example of like, you know, bargain basement prices. But the problem with doing that is you've got to be able to have the infrastructure in place to be able to do ridiculous levels of volume. And let's face it, most people don't. Like I don't. I'm, I'm sure, I don't know about you. I'm sure yeah. you probably don't either. Um, you know, it's, you need to, to be able to set those things up is really, really quite difficult. Much, much, much harder than just going, I'm the most expensive, whatever, and there's a good reason for it, and there's 10x in your prices overnight, uh, and working with fewer people and making more money for it. Um, now, for most coaches, now most coaches uh, who are listening to this, um, or you know, most people of any kind of business, a lot of them, their business is themselves. Like my business is myself at the moment. It might not be in the future, but right now it is, which means there's only, so, there's only one of me. I only have so many hours in a day, only so much time I want to work. So I can't do the Walmart Ikea thing. I can't sell volume. I have to sell high ticket. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Unless I have an info product where I sell that and I have no input into that whatsoever, which, you know, I do have some info products, but they're not like the main, you know, they're not the main, uh, the main part of my business. Yeah, absolutely. So w one more thing that I know about you was uh, that you were a former gambler. What, yeah. was, what was your gambler? And former means are you, are you done for good? Yeah, I mean, this. I used to like a little bit beforehand, but there's something about turning it into your, like your ten hour a day job for a year that makes it not that fun anymore. You know, <laughs> especially when, especially when it's like you kind of like you need this to you need this to work in order to put food on the table. It's like it's you know, it's like like going back to a job. Now, if I was placed a bed night, but now it'd be like going back to a job that I hated. You know, um, yeah, I actually did it. Uh, I don't know if it's possible over in North America, but I did like a version of sports trading, which I want bore people with. But it's a bit like you can. You can, it's called backing and laying. So essentially I was really betting on before a horse race, I would bet on whether, 
uh, like the favourite, whether the favourite's going to come in, whether the odds are going to shorten or whether the odds are going to lengthen uh, before the race. And then you can close out before the race. There's a way of closing out before the race, if you got it right, where you would make uh, a profit regardless of which horse won. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't want to go into that now because I feel like it's a confusing explanation. It's just going to be super, uh, super irrelevant for your audience. But yeah, that's what I did. So I would aim to make like, say, £20 a race, like $30 a race or whatever. Uh, but you know, if you had like 20, 30 races in the day, you could you know, do quite nicely over the course of a day. But in the middle of summer in the UK, the horse racing starts at like midday and there's a race every five to 10 minutes until eight or nine o'clock at night. So you just sat there with my two screens. I sat there with two screens on the laptop. I couldn't even get or take a piss sometimes because there's like so many races coming through. And I'm just like, by the end of it, I did quite well in the summer, but then the winter comes along and there's fewer races because who wants to go to the racetrack in January? And it's like the money dried up. And I'm like, this isn't fun anymore. And it's kind of stressful. And I'm just sat and I'm going a little bit stir crazy because I'm just sat indoors talking to my cat and no one else. And I'm like, okay. I might just go and get a job again. And that's exactly what I did. And I've not placed a bet since. That was like 2014. Okay. So I'm pretty much, pretty much the same. Although, uh, I was, I was thinking I was going to be pro, uh, a pro poker player. And really? Yes. I even had, uh, won a, um, entry to the European poker tour, everything paid and everything. And I ended up not going. That's when I gave it up because it was going too far and I was playing mostly online. Mm-hmm. And it was like all the screens going, several tables at the same time. How many, how many tables did you play at once? Uh, I would do up to six tables, which uh, may sound cool, but it was draining me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, multitasking six tables. Uh, right now, mm-hmm. looking back, I, I know so many mistakes are being made. If you have six mm-hmm. tables, you are making mistakes. There's no way to, to be a pro like that. So uh, I did I did the poker thing for a while as well as part of that year, you know, and uh, yeah. I did like the problem is that uh, I think in about two thousand and eight, if you were trying to play online poker, uh, if you were a reasonable level of standard, you could probably make a living from it. But now everyone's just too good now. Like everyone knows the right moves to make at each time, and you really are just hoping for people to come in and make mistakes or find like some fish coming and everyone gets excited and steals all their money. But well, otherwise, you'd like well at least for me anyway. I just I was just like I can't get good enough of it. So I played like thirty thousand hands in one month. Like just practicing, 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 practicing on my visa. I think there's a site, it probably still exists, it's called advancedpokertraining.com. And I went on there and just signed up and played over and over and over and over and over again. It'd be like, when you play a wrong move, the computer would be like, no, you should play this because of this. So it's great for figuring out like starting hands to play with and wants to throw away. But ultimately, everyone else is doing these kind of things who's trying to win it. And I'm just like, again, it's just like, do you know, another, another thing, I don't know if this is something that ever taught you doing this. I was like, this stuff was cool for a while, but eventually I was a bit like, even though I'm making a living from this, this is not fulfilling in the slightest. Like I don't feel like I'm contributing to the well-being of the planet in any way here. I'm, I feel like I'm just I feel like I'm beating the system, which is cool in its own way. But you know, when I die, is anybody going to give a shit that I play poker for however long and want some money? No, it doesn't benefit anybody. No, no, it doesn't, and uh, that's absolutely the point. That it's it's a waste. It's a waste of time. It's more when you start realizing that you can only remember the times that you win. It, it tells me that uh, there's an addiction and, because most of the people that are addicted cannot remember when they lose, right? The, the, the loss yeah. is temporary. And then when they win, even if they lost, let's say you lost 10 grand, you win five and you get super excited because you won. And that started happening and I'm like, okay, I'm done. And I gave up my European poker tour. Poker tour. I didn't even go. But, uh, <laughs> but that's wow, it. But you must be quite, you must be quite good if you got onto like uh, that sort of level. Yeah, you know, you know what? Uh, I always thought that I was decent. Everybody was tell me would tell me that that I was good, and um, the thing that would really, really break me was the uh, kind of the opposite of what you said. It was not the good players; it was the bad ones, the ones that would go all in. When I, uh, you know, I have three of a kind, and they go all in, and in the river they luck out and you beat me. That was that was the end no, of me. I mean, the unfairness of it all. Yeah, yeah. The Just the pure luck ones that have nothing. Like, they go all in with a two and a seven. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing here? And they're like, hey. <laughs> yes. So we're getting a little bit of her off track. But, uh... Yeah, I've got, I've got slightly off track. <laughs> yeah. No. If, anyone, no if anyone's still listening at this point. Yes. So, Richard, when people listening right now, if they want to find the magic sauce and they want to find you join your group and join your training 
where can they find you? Uh, yeah, a couple of ways. So first of all, website is magicsourcemarketing.com. So they can go on there. If, if they like this, if they liked, you know, the five minutes that we managed to stay on track, <laughs> if they like that, then they can find more of it. I've got um, on that site is a blog. So I took all my best like Facebook posts over the last year, including the live video trainings and put them on a blog. So they're all in one place because I kind of felt like Facebook, you sort of get lost after two days, you know, and it's, you don't see them post again. So if people want more information, and more in-depth trainings on like how to, some of the stuff I was talking about with like uh, the engagement posts or whatever and different kinds of posts that you make on Facebook and more stuff around that, then by all means, go away and look at that. Um, also, if they want to join my Facebook group, it's called The Magic Source for Online Marketing. So you can just go and search for that. And obviously, if they want to find me, just type in my name and they can do that as well. I may actually steal that idea from you, the uh, the best Facebook posts, putting them on on the blog. Do you take the screenshot of them and post? No, no, no. It's, it's a WordPress blog. So I, t- I, t- I took the uh, I take the words and then... You know, if I need to change the words because it's not on Facebook, you know, you need to and put a put a picture in there, make it look nice, maybe change some color blocks, or whatever. But pretty much, yeah, it's just cut and paste the posting. Yeah, that's very good. That's one of the things that uh, I notice is also a waste is when you have something that is actually really good content, and then after a while, it disappears through the feed, right? And, exactly. Uh, that's that's the thing with Facebook. You make a great post today, and it's gone. You know, within a day, maybe two days. You know, like I know people can go to your profile and see it, but it's still, if you're making one post a day, no one's scrolling back three months and see the brilliant post you made in you know January or whatever. Uh, so you're a bit like, God, we're making all this awesome content that's just been lost forever. So I was like, I'd like to just to have it all in one place that's mine. You know, if Facebook decide one day that um, they don't want me to be a part of Facebook anymore, and they block me from it or facebook closes down and tiktok becomes the next big thing and i'm like oh, i've got this content well you know i've got somewhere else with all this stuff in now yeah that's true and that actually it's a matter of time right because we know not everything lasts forever so someday something will happen so it's always nice to have your your safety something that you're you're in charge of yeah something that's yours very good richard thank you very much i'm going to have everything on the show notes here, I'll have your links, your Facebook group, LinkedIn, your Magic Sauce Marketing, and everybody that's listening, please check them out. If you are driving right now, do not check them out. Wait till you get home. <laughs> and uh, Richard, it's a pleasure having you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Quinn. Thank you.